So this whole subject of identity is so critical because let me say this. The way you see yourself influences every area of your life. You will never rise above any higher, any height in your life to any greater measure, listen, than how you view yourself. If you view yourself as small, you have a small life. If you view yourself as average, you have an average life. If you view yourself as great, you'll have a great life. It's so significant in regards to how we view ourselves. Listen to what Batterson says. Most of us live our entire lives as strangers to ourselves. We know more about others than we know about ourselves. Our true identities get buried beneath the mistakes we've made, insecurities we've acquired, lies we believe, but trying to be who we are not simply amounts, listen to this statement, only forfeiting our spiritual birthright. It's not that we are simply lying to ourselves. Somewhere along the way, we lose ourselves. You see this significance and what this means in regards to identity? I'm going to get ready to open up and read some scripture to you. But before I do, let me pray over you just a moment. And then we'll look at this for a few moments. Lord, uh, I've asked you today early in the, or in the early morning hours today to help me to not just bring a, a talk or just information. Lord, if, if there's no anointing involved in what I say today, then that's all it is. It's just a talk. I've just given a speech. I've just shared information. But God, when you come and lay your hand upon us and when you anoint me to be able to preach and teach, then it becomes revelation. And I pray for your anointing to come. Not just upon me, but Lord, anoint the hearts and ears and minds of men and women online as well as on site to receive today as we look into your word. And as we lean into your word, Lord, lean into our hearts today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, let's dive in. Because if we want to talk about identity... We have to be able to start with the early Genesis narrative. Today, I will lay groundwork. I will just lay a foundation for the next few weeks where that will go. But we will look at substance today. Genesis 126, then God said, let's read it together. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. Let me stop right here before we conclude. Uh, before we continue, do you suspect God had something to do with defining who you are? According to this passage. In the likeness, so that they may rule over fish and sea and birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and all the creatures that move along the ground. Listen to what the psalmist says. Listen to what he says. Psalm 139, 14. I praise you because you, because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know them so well. The psalmist had this comprehension and understanding that the identity of who he was was so deeply associated with his creator and how God had created him. Even within the womb, even before his arrival on the planet, God is already involved in his life, already defining who he is in life, already establishing his purpose in life. This is seen in another profound passage and is found in Jeremiah 1.5. Before I formed you in the womb. This is, this is a great word for someone here today listening and worried and feeling heavy and shame. Because you're listening to this preacher preach today on identity and the only thing you feel about your life it is, is a story of damage because of, what been, because of what's been done to you or what you've done to yourself. Could I remind you before I finish reading this passage, Jesus died for your damage. And he resurrected and he came out of a grave so that you could be free from your damage. So you're not defined by those things. Even though I recognize, those of you listening to me online and on campus, 
the world and our culture and society shouts and screams the message that you are defined by what you do or your upbringing or these things. But when you listen to the words of Jeremiah 1.5, he said, before you were formed in the womb, God said, I knew you and I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. These passages that I've read to you on the onset of this is so foundational because it, it gives you and I some framework to understand that when it comes to identity, answering the question of who I am, why am I here, you have to start with Scripture and God's Word. You have to be able to look into God's Word and understand there is a backdrop a foundation, a framework, a doorway in which you walk through to understand who you really are. The late Tim Keller writes about this when he talks about how we're shaped and formed by so many other things and our identity at times, we go through this sense of confusion or crisis. Listen what the late Tim Keller said, when you and I were born, we were not born into a neutral space. Rather, we were born into a river of cultural space and currents that formed, listen to what he says, and deformed our very identities. Whether we consciously realize it or not, every culture without our permission and without naming such imposes an identity formation process on us, its members. So we, listen, the question is not whether or not you and I, from our childhood to now, are being formed or have been formed, it's in whom have we been formed by. Because we're being shaped and we're being formed by the things that are around us. We're familiar with what we would call filters, identity filters. We'll talk more about these next week, but just for a look at these in a glimpse, there's the genetic, there's the biological, there, there's the genetic makeup so unique to each and every one of us even stated within Scripture that there's something so unique about you as though there's no two snowflakes that are alike. There's no, other, there's no other individual just like you. Turn over to the person beside you and say, you must be pretty special. Just go ahead and tell them, you must be pretty special. Now you can say, I know, I am. Because no one's quite like you and next week we'll talk about some of this because it's not just the genetic it's the family upbringing it's our story it's our history it's the things we were born into we didn't choose the family that we were born into we didn't choose these things but we were a part of a story that's been this is woven together by God we're a part of a greater story I'll touch base, the, touch base on this thought towards the end of the message Genetics, family, experiences, all of these things have some degree, have shaped you and I. And that's whether good or bad, but they have had a part of shaping us. But what I want to open up today is something that's really, a, it's, a, it's another layer or foundation underneath just the filters of genetics, and family, and experiences. Charles Taylor writes about it this way. He talks about identity in these terms. He talks about traditional identity and modern identity. Traditional identity is something that started, and we're talking in the early, as man grew and, and societies and things become some, some sense of normality, and there was some sense of societal norms. There was a time when traditional identity in its framework was shaped by this. And here's what Taylor writes. It was honor-based. And here's what he means by honor-based. Your identity had to do with an honorable life. And much of what your life was known of, known as, in an, on, in an honorable sense, was related to the sacrifice of what you were willing to give up for the betterment and the well-being of the community that was around you. And early on, that this was considered a sense of even identity within the community, that, the honoring, that, that there was an honorable understanding of your name and identity because you were known as an individual, listen to this, more than self-minded, you were otherness-minded. 
You lived with a sense of what was happening around you. Taylor goes on the right and says, but there was a shift gradually and so subtle we we didn't even recognize it. And after the turn of the 20th century, it was no longer traditional identity became known as modern identity. What's the difference with modern identity? Modern identity uh, became the norm and had less to do, listen to what Taylor writes, with honor and community and modern identity had to do with the projection of self. And because of this need and this sense to project self and be more focused on self, then we begin to define our self, our worth of self, and we begin to define, listen to what Taylor says, ultimately we started to determine, we determined within ourselves what is good and what is worth. The only problem with this is you live within the circle of self. This is completely contradictory to what the Apostle Paul says in Galatians 2.20 when Paul says, if you're a Christ follower, you have a new identity. But your identity in understanding this in Christ doesn't start within the circle of yourself. Please, please listen to me today, those of you online and those on campus. You'll never understand or answer the question of who am I, why am I here, if you start with yourself. The only way we're ever going to understand who we are and our purpose for on the earth is we have to start with God who created us. And the Apostle Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. You ought to have this passage, just stick it on your refrigerator. Put it somewhere as a magnet within the car. Keep this before you because Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So everything about this modern identity shift that starts with the circle of self, according to the Apostle Paul, if he were in the room having a conversation with us today, and in one sense he is through this passage, he would say you cannot understand who you are by starting with yourself. You have to be able to understand and realize that the conversation starts with God and what God has done in your life. Let me give you a few foundational observations that's going to give us a path for the next few weeks. And here's the first one. This is foundational to identity. Listen, this is critical. If somebody misses it's in your family, tell them to go back and watch because it'll connect the dots for the next few weeks. Here's the first one. Foundational to, uh, to identity is this. Understand that God defines what is good. God defines what is good. Why is that? Because God is both the source of good and the one who declares other things are good. You find this in scripture. Genesis 1:31. God saw what he had made and God said it was, help me say it, very good. Scripture teaches us that good is defined by God. Please listen to me today. It's not identified by the cultural shift of modern identity starting with self. God defines what is good. This is foundational. This is like you can run all the bases when you hit the ball and it can go over the fence. But if you don't touch first, do you score the point? Same here foundationally. You'll never get around the field. You'll never get around the bases regarding identity unless you first touch first base. And first base is God defines what is good. Scripture teaches us God decides this. Every concept of justice, righteousness, perfection, wisdom, goodness, think about it. It's all found in the character and the nature of God. Here's the second thing that's foundational to identity. And that is acceptance and approval comes from God as a Christ follower. Can you see how this gets twisted? When regardless to your genetic makeup or your family upbringing or your life experiences, do you see how easily life becomes so twisted that unless you have a strong biblical view of the foundation of identity and how it is formed, it can you see how easy it is for it to get twisted that I find my identity in what I do? Or my career? 
or my education or my image, my appearance, my acceptance within a community, what others think about me. But you need to understand that as a Christ follower, something that is foundational to understanding identity is not just that God is the ultimate source of defining what is good. God also is the one that determines acceptance and approval from God. If God is the ultimate authority to define what is good, don't you think that it would make sense that God possesses the right to determine who is good? If he's the only one that can say that is good, I think that gives him also the right to say who is good. If you follow this out, you realize that after creating Adam and Eve in Genesis, God looked at them and said, this, they, are good. This is so important what I'm getting ready to say because as a pastor of over 25 years, in personal counseling sessions or time spending with coffees with people, I would say that identity and a lack of biblical understanding or freedom in some aspect of identity often is the greatest root of issue and pain in a person's heart. This is personally what I've discovered. If I drill down into it, if I ask enough questions, something eventually comes back to the issue of identity. And here's why this is important. Because what happened in the garden and the fall of Adam and Eve was not simply just about wrong behavior. Adam and Eve attempted to know what is good and evil apart from God. And when they attempted to know what was good or evil from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, rather than the tree of life, they, at that point, attempted to know the difference, and listen to this, they lost their sense of worth. That's why many writers talk about what happened in the garden as lost identity. 2 Corinthians 5.19, God chooses, and this is what's beautiful about it. When you see this story, I'm going to get ready to read you this passage, but this is what, I don't want to just preach to the, I don't want to preach to the idea that so many people come on this campus or online today knowing I'm broken and I'm growing and I'm being healed. People don't always need to be reminded every week you're broken, I'm damaged. I know we understand those things. Here's what I want to speak to. I want you to capture the reality of Scripture that says grace is greater than your brokenness. Grace is greater than your shame. Grace is greater than your damage. Whatever the experiences that you feel have shaped you negatively or brought the confusion into your life, one of the most beautiful pictures of grace throughout Scripture is in the early Genesis narrative when Adam and Eve make the decision, they eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, They've lost the sense of worth. God does not abandon them. Rather, God begins to pursue them. And God pursues them, and the backdrop of this is he pursues them through a story of grace. And this is the very promise of Jesus Christ, the Messiah that would come in his death and resurrection. And what is the purpose of that? To restore you and I, to our proper identity of who we actually are and we're created to be. This is found in 2 Corinthians 5, 19. God chooses not to count our sins against us. Notice what he says. And he declares us righteous in his sight through the perfect goodness of Jesus. Listen, we could go home right now, wrap it up and go to Cracker Barrel because that is some good news right there. Listen, you and all the king's men and all your greatest self-help books, we will never on this side of heaven be able to measure up to that type of goodness. But we don't have to. Why? Because Jesus did it for us. And when we receive Jesus Christ into our heart and life, we now become participants of this. And then listen, some of you would say, but what about when I fall? What about when I mess up? What about when I make a mistake? This is the beauty of the kingdom. 
Because when it comes to identity in God, when you fail, you're not excluded from the community. This is the way the kingdom works. You're not excluded from the community. As a matter of fact, the Bible says this is an opportunity for you to grow in your relationship. And the Bible calls it godly repentance. 2 Corinthians 7.10 Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. We've made repentance an ugly word in the church. Listen to me. Repentance is a gift. And it's given to the body of Christ and to each and every one of us because God knows as children we're growing up. We associate the concept of new birth as being born again, but we forget the other side of the coin. If, he, if God equates salvation to a new birth and being reborn again, don't you think he's also suggesting, giving you the picture that as a child, now we've got to grow up? I'm going to ask you a question. As a child growing up, did you ever fall? Did you? You ever fall? Hopefully you never had parents that sat there and said, I told you you were going to fall, now get up. And I'm keeping record of every time you fall. And that's often the environment that many people associate God with, who is an angry God in heaven, completely upset at us, mad at us, keeping record of every single wrong behavior. But we forget that at the core and the nature of God, who is for justice and righteousness, his core in nature is love and forgiveness and mercy. And he says in this passage that godly sorrow brings repentance. And God says through the godly sorrow, you're going to be led to repent. Change the direction you're going. You're constantly going to be in a path of understanding that I need to change the, the trajectory of the way I think, the patterns in my life. You know what this does? Listen to me. It causes you and I to have a greater dependence on God. When I fall, when I mess up, when I make a mistake, thank God that in the design and framework of identity within the kingdom, I'm not excluded from the community of faith. In that moment, I have an opportunity in godly sorrow and repentance to begin to learn and grow from it and depend upon God in a greater measure. Do you see this? This is right in Scripture. Apart from God, we're slaves to sin, but in Christ we have new identity. Romans 5.10, for, for while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through his death and his son. How much more having been reconciled, Shall he be saved through his life? Listen to Titus 3, 5. He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. You know, the only reason mercy is even needed is because somebody's guilty, right? So what he says is, because of his mercy, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and the renewal of his Holy Spirit. What are you saying, Pastor Clint? Here's what I'm trying to say to you. If you're a Christ follower, you're perfected in the way God sees you, not through your ability of what you're able to pull off. Your perfection in the way the Father sees you is through what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. This is extremely important for you to understand, foundational to identity, or you will always live in a vicious cycle of shame. Matthew 5 48, if I'm correct, he says to them in Matthew 5, 48, you shall be perfect even as the Father is perfect. That is a high standard. Who is he talking to? His disciples. Do you think at that time when he said this, the disciples were perfect? When he says you shall be perfect, it's future tense. What is he saying? He's saying to his disciples, you're not perfect now, and you're never going to be able to do enough to be perfect. But Jesus knew, I'm getting ready to go to the cross, and I'm getting ready to do something on the cross that's going to take care of the perfection that's needed in your life. And every time the Father sees you, he's not going to see you through your brokenness. He's going to see you through my righteousness and what I've done on the cross. And then you're going to be raised to life and understand that your identity is not in what's happened back here that's been bad. Your identity now is in what Jesus Christ has done on the cross, and that is good. 
That's identity. Real quick, let's lay this next one. It's not just the fact that God defines what is good. It's not just the fact that acceptance and approval comes from God. It's also fully known and accepted and loved. Because if my identity as a Christ follower is foundationally connected to what Jesus has done in the work of his death and resurrection, this is critical now for me to understand and know I am fully known and accepted and loved by God. You remember a few weeks ago when I preached, I said the two greatest questions in humanity is, who will love me as I am? Current state. And who has the power to help me become what I need to be? Those are the two greatest questions. And the enemy in the world comes to answer the questions and give you all types of uh, horizontal opportunities to settle those issues. But listen, listen, it'll never be settled horizontally. It's only going to be settled vertically. This is so important for us to understand. Your identity, I want you to, I don't think I, I was up so early this morning, and this doesn't happen a lot, but occasionally God will totally flip something in the last part of a message. So I rewrote some of the last part of the script. But it's all good. I'm not going to keep you for another 30 minutes. I'm just going to share with you what God downloaded and added to this point. I want you to write this down because there's two specific things about identity rooted in identity that you're understanding. It's critical for you to understand the way that God operates with you and I. Two things. Your identity is rooted in the understanding of God's purpose for mankind. Two things that make you and I who we are and who God is. I'm going to say this again. Two central things that make you and I who we are and who God is. Write these words down. It's life and love. Life and love. Now, I want you to think about what I'm saying here. The problem with our world is if you only ask the question, who am I, you started with yourself. Here's the better question. And if you don't get anything else, get this and write it down. Process it over coffee, Cracker Barrel, a little bit of pecan pie, a little bit of ice cream on top. I'm sorry, it's just getting that time. They hold it for Amy and I. So I normally get like the pecan type. I'll get a coffee. Amy likes the chocolate Coca-Cola cake. I told Amy, I said, that is sinful and wrong, but this pecan pie is holy and right. I'm going to stay right over here. Where was I? What was I saying? I don't know. Here's the right question. Not who am I. Here's the correct question. But who do I come from? There's the appropriate question. Not who am I? Where do I come from? I am, listen to me, listen, I'm telling you, our world, listen, there's people that are just so, the articles I'm reading, the sessions I'm listening to, the pastors that are in conferences talking, the way the world's responding when it comes to identity confusion and all the things that you know that's going on. Listen to this, listen. When the appropriate question is, but who do I come from? Because I am who I came from. This means when you, when you ask, where did I come from? It's not, a, it's not starting with me. It's starting with God. And this is the only doorway that helps us with the identity. Let me ask you a question. What was it that made Adam and Eve? What made Adam and Eve? and Eve who they were. The breath of God and life. Adam was no more than the image of a man until God breathed life into him. Listen, the Bible says, then he became a living, help me finish it, soul. Let me give you another sentence for it. He breathed into him and he became someone. You're never going to find identity outside of the life of God. As a matter of fact, this is the issue in Scripture of where we understand from the beginning 
that identity was intended to always be understood vertically from God. It was never intended to be horizontal. And I'll talk about this next week. Horizontal means I get my identity from my job, my education, my career, my degrees, my appearance, my relationships to people. And we're always, and in that environment, it is a vicious cycle. Because you realize, I've been climbing up a ladder one day, and you get to the top, and it's against the wrong wall. You've got to go back and realize that when it comes to identity, it will never be understood horizontally. It has to start vertically. Vertically. 